Should be on now. Here we go. Fantastic. Wow, I'm, I'm really enthused by the uh, crowd we've gotten tonight and everybody's uh, masks and socially distanced as appropriate, so thank you for that. My name is Jack Santos, and as a member of the Friends of William Lloyd Garrison, let me welcome you all as Friends of Garrison to the annual William Lloyd Garrison Lecture. And oh, by the way, happy birthday to William Lloyd Garrison. He was born 216 years ago today. We gather every year on his birthday to not only remember a great Newberry Porter who had a major impact on the history of the United States, but to also remind us uh, that many of the issues Garrison voiced uh, the concerns about throughout the 1800s are still affecting us today. Last year, we learned a lot about Garrison and his relationship with Harriet Tubman and her family. This year, our guest speaker, Eddie Carson from the Governor's Academy, whom we'll hear more about in a few minutes, will tell us about Garrison's influence on modern political thought. But before we get started, let me give some credit to a small troop of people that helped organize this. Known informally as the Friends of William Lloyd Garrison, They've come together over the past few years because of their interest in this one great man. Like Mary Ann McCauley, Richard Lodge, Rebecca Regnett, Bill Quigley, and Andrea Eigerman. And I, thank you. And I would be remiss if I did also highlight and give thanks to Patricia Pecknick who was instrumental in organizing last year's talk, as well as the young preservationists of the Newburyport Preservation Trust and the Newburyport Public Library for its help hosting last year's talk via Zoom during a year of COVID surprises. The Friends have supported the Preservation Trust effort to establish an informational sign with two signs about Garrison that will be placed in Garrison Gardens on School Street. And it'll be across from Garrison's birthplace, which was recently and beautifully reconstructed. These signs are funded by the Newburyport Bank and the City of Newburyport Community Preservation Fund. Watch for that installation in 2022, which believe it or not, is only a few weeks from now. Please join me in a round of applause to this group of friends and all the neighbors in their efforts to keep William Lloyd Garrison's memory alive. <laughs> this event could not have happened without the support of the Newburyport Preservation Trust, the Newburyport Daily News, and through the generosity of our hosts, Old South Presbyterian Church. We're very fortunate to get a grant from the Massachusetts Humanities Bridge Street Fund, and we had much local support from organizations including the Museum of Old Newberry, Christine Malpica and Amesbury's Imagine Studios, and the City of Newburyport's Human Rights Commission, which is headed by Amir Ibrahim. Our evening will begin with a few words from Old South's Reverend Scott DeBlock followed by an introduction to Eddie Carson by Richard Lodge of the Daily News. And then one, once Mr. Carson completes his lecture, Rebecca Regnett will open a question and answer session and bring us to a close. But our efforts don't end there. Anyone can be a friend of William Lloyd Garrison and help us organize next year's birthday party and lecture. Just send an email to garrisonlecture at porthistory.com. And don't worry if you didn't write that email address down, because we're recording this on YouTube, and you'll be able to find it there and on our website. So contact us and be a friend of William Lloyd Garrison. So begin, to begin the birthday festivities, join me in uh, welcoming Reverend Scott DeBlock.
Good evening. On behalf of the people of Old South Presbyterian Church, I want to welcome you to this sacred space. I began here as co-interim pastor with Tim Dolan in September of this year, so I'm new to Newburyport. I live in Scarborough, Maine. I love coming down the Maine Pike and being here and seeing you and uh, getting in touch and involved in this wonderful community and the history that this place holds. I would get out of my, I get out of my car over there and I walk by the house here and see the plaque with some guy named William Lloyd Garrison. I'm like, hmm. And then parked next to it is a Tesla. <laughs> to me, that is a wonderful linking of past and present and future and how the voice of William Lloyd Garrison still speaks to us today. This is a church that was indeed founded by George Whitfield during the Great Awakening. George's mission was more of a personal, spiritual awakening. But as we know about Mr. Garrison, it was more institutional and societal and how to liberate ourselves from those things we create that need to be changed and transformed. So we continue that here in our church and our congregation as well. How do we offer a change and transformation, bringing, putting our faith into practice and moving that into the world to share God's love in new and wonderful ways. So I am so thankful that you are here with us. I have a lot to learn. And as you see, George Whitfield is buried here. It's a rather intimidating thing when you preach above George. <laughs> but I'm thinking in my head right now that somewhere in the eternal realm, William Boy Garrison and George Whitfield are having a wonderful conversation on how things were shared and discussed. Indeed, George Whitfield's relationship with slavery was enigmatic at best. So there's a good conversation going on, and I wish I was part of that dance. So again, welcome and enjoy this evening together. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, I won't ask if you can hear me because I think I can hear myself. I'm Richard Lodge from the Daily News, and I'm very glad to see everybody here tonight. And I'm also very honored to be here as the editor of the local newspaper. I won't say I'm following in William Lloyd Garrison's footsteps, but certainly following the tradition of publishing a newspaper in Newburyport. Um, as Jack said, he was born right around the corner here in 1805. He worked as what was called a printer's devil, cleaning the ink off of type when he was a kid. And he worked at the, uh, the Newburyport Herald, uh, which was eventually evolved into the Daily News. And then he uh, went on to found the Liberator in Boston and ran that for decades. Um, so I'm here, I'll be brief. I'm going to introduce the uh, speaker tonight. Edward Carson is the Dean of Multicultural Education at Governor's Academy. He currently teaches an honors seminar course in the history department on race, class, gender, and climate change. He advises the Black Latinx Association and Gender Sexuality Alliance. He lives on campus with his brilliant, loving, and radical wife, Jeanette, and their dog, Baxter. Now, I was prompted on some of this, as you can imagine. <laughs> he also told me that he's here today because he is the soul of two parents, Diane and Vincent Carson, who sacrificed so that he could profess radical love. Edward Carson has published papers in peer-reviewed journals, delivered numerous conference papers, and given lectures throughout the country. He sat on leading panels about race, religion, and society. He's written and published book chapters, and most recently, he published his own book, Socialism and Democracy and the Life, Thought, and legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois. It's my pleasure to welcome this year's William Lloyd Garrison lecture speaker, Edward Carson. Good morning, brothers and sisters and non-binary folks. I'm excited to be up here. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah? 
okay. I mean, sometimes I sit here and I wonder, do I really need this thing? So I may get tested just a little bit and everything, but I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the, um, the Friends of Garrison for inviting me, sponsors, my colleagues who've participated here, some of my new friends, and I'll get the chance to meet some of y'all a little bit later. My um, wonderful students and advisees who are in the show tonight, just gonna give y'all a quick shout out. You know, we're here to talk about Garrison. And as we think about that brother, and as we're here to talk about him, we know that you can't talk about Garrison without talking about some of the endemic challenges within the country known as the United States. The reality by which white supremacy has manifested itself over a period of time. It is difficult to talk about race in America, folks. We know that. It's challenging to talk about race in America. Here we start with slavery, and guess what? We start with slavery and we're gonna end with slavery. We cannot escape it because we're unwilling to talk about it and we're unwilling to tackle it in so many ways. There have been a lot of different uh, incarnations as we've had these conversations about race in American and slavery, but yet a lot of folks assume that just because the, emancip the Emancipation Proclamation came to an end and slavery ended, we were all done with this conversation, but yet folks forgot about Jim Crow 1, Jim Crow Part 2, Jim Crow Part 3, oh, and Jim Crow Part 4 and Jim Crow Part 5 too. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, and boo, I see that clock's there, so I will try to take a look at it occasionally, but I can't make any promises at all, you know. You may know this, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, and folks would always say, don't know about the white churches, but the black churches back home, the Baptist church, the ministers will sit there and look at the clock and say, man, y'all on my time, so we'll see what's going to happen there. We may be here for a little bit, so we'll find out what's going to happen. One of the reasons it's so difficult, folks, to talk about race is because people have a fear. They have a fear of the past and they have a fear of realizing the realities that exist today in the 21st century. Talking about race will get people in trouble. And I'm here to tell you, it's interesting. I can point to the hate mail, the emails, things that I get that pop out of nowhere where folks just say, you keep talking and keep saying things and we're gonna have a problem. Those folks don't scare me. I'm here to tell you, White supremacy with hoods, white supremacy with folks who look and operate in that particular way, those things shouldn't um, scare you and they don't scare me. Don't frighten me whatsoever. Now, there are things that do make me nervous though. And those things that make me nervous sometimes, of course, is the fact that we expect things to happen from certain white supremacist groups, but sometimes I become concerned as a black man when white folks decide to turn a coal back to silence on the problems of the 21st century. And that problem has manifested itself all the way back to the 19th century. We as black people have been defined by the reality of death, folks. The reality of death in the hollowness of modern civilizations. And I'm not convinced that's gonna change. My disappointment in many ways comes from the silence. Oftentimes of white liberals, when they claim that there's a semblance of being not racist and not ready to take on and challenge the things that we're seeing right out on the streets today. Things we're unwilling to talk about and think about. The same things that Garrison was wrestling with two centuries ago, and here we are in 2021, we're still wrestling with those things today. Folks, these conversations about race, they feel threatening to the normality of folks who want us to move forward and we've yet to have the conversation of the past. We have not had the conversations that Garrison was trying to have a long time ago, even before lynch mobs were going after him. We live in 2021 and clearly racism didn't expire when slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Some folks believe since Martin Luther King gave this great speech that racism just dissipated, it came to an end. But yet, that was just a start. King, as he once pronounced, lived in two Americas. And it's interesting because when January comes about, you will not see folks publishing on their social media pages all the great quotes he had to say about the two Americas that exist. They're gonna talk about things in which we can't even fathom and things we don't wanna think about. Brother King is gonna pick up the mantle in ways that Garrison left the mantle, making people feel a little uncomfortable, a little uneasy, and you know, let me be frank here, folks. If you came to be romanticized about the 
fruitfulness, the greatness of this inhabited perfect land we call the United States. Well, my friends, I am sorry you have come to the wrong lecture. I am sorry. You're going to be greatly disappointed tonight if you think you came to hear that, because that is not the tale that you're going to get. This is not a love story, folks. This is a death-defying tale about blackness and the reality of how we struggle in white spaces for the legacy of this country for a long period of time, before the Constitution and after the Constitution. Folks who know me, they know I'm not an optimistic person. Have you figured that out yet? Yeah, I just want to kind of give a, a, kind of a check on you just for a second here. I'm not an optimistic person. I'm here to make you fall in love, or excuse me, I'm not here to make you fall in love with the oppression of history that people seem to romanticize and want to talk about all the time. Oh, Brother Carson, tell me a little story. Tell me a little love story. I'm here to tell you about a nightmare that exists, and that nightmare here in the United States is the nightmare of white supremacy. As a, histor as a historian, I'm a critic of history. I like to dissect, I like to think about it. There is no love fest with history for me. I am not a history buff. I pick up texts, I pick up books, I'm delving into those things, and I'm trying to explore the ways that I confront the present problem of white supremacy. Because see, look here, that is what I deal with every single day. That is what I'm gonna deal with when I walk out of those doors a little bit later. That is the issue that I'm gonna continue to face, and that is an issue that we have to face even here in great old progressive liberal Newburyport. I love seeing the Black Lives Matter signs out there, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's all good and everything, but we need to have a real conversation. I mean, at the end, I'm a black man in America, much like Frederick Douglass. I have a lot to say about the narrative that encapsulate black folks and black souls, but I also want to tell you a story, and that story is kind of akin to the story that Malcolm X used to tell us. That story was titled, Let Me Tell You About the American Nightmare. And you would have thought the American nightmare would have been solved by that radical white brother by the name of William Lloyd Garrison. So I do not want you to be confused about tonight. I am hopeful. I am hopeful. If I wasn't hopeful, I wouldn't be a dean of multicultural education. I wouldn't be teaching my courses over at the Governor's Academy. I wouldn't be talking to good old great folks who've kind of come out here tonight in many ways. I wouldn't be mentoring and loving on my advisees the way that I do because they're going to really bring the change that needs to happen. But yet, as we talk about these things, right, the greatness of this amazing land, the perfectionists, the stories, the things that are happening, all these folks who are begging and driving and are trying to get here into this country, I'm oftentimes reminded that there was a radical brother in the 20th century by the name of Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey organized and marched and led roughly three million black folks out of the country. Black folks were knocking on the door and saying, it is time to go because see what Garrison started and what we thought ended with the Civil War did not come to an end whatsoever. Black folks were living in an American nightmare at the time when Marcus Garvey came along and said, you know what? I know the American Colonization Society said we need to send black folks back to Africa. We need to get rid of them. This isn't their land. Garrison, that brother pushing back on the American Colonization Society. But yet, by the time we get to the 1920s, Garvey's sitting there and saying, nothing has really changed in this land. Let's get on a boat. Let's head back home. Let's go somewhere else. The largest black movement uh, within the history of this country. And why? Because they agreed with Alexei de Tocqueville. They could not conceive of a multiracial democracy taking place here in the United States. Black folks wanted to leave because they didn't think that a multiracial democracy was possible. In the last chapter of Alexei de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, the future conditions of the three races that inhabited the United States, he, he proclaimed that there will never be a multiracial democracy in this country. 
And I'm convinced in many ways, right? Not to be a pessimist because, you know, I'm a realist. I'm not optimistic that there's a narrative of truth that's there. All I have to do is pick up the paper. All I have to do is just observe some of the things that are happening. We go back to Brother King in 1965, and what do we see? The strides of 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, starts to look a little like this. Every single day, folks, more and more and more. In redrawing district lines to push out black and brown folks who are engaged in the franchise of voting, it's looking a little bit more like this. I told you this was not a romanticized story tonight, but a death-defying tale that we got to say. And if I haven't made you upset or mad at me yet, that's okay. You just hang on it just a little bit longer. I'll get to that point. Um, but I want you to hang in there because we've got to think about the challenges that radical and what some folks call fanatical brother named Garrison stated. Let me tell you about the story as we move, to, move towards Garrison here. Back on November the 8th, 2008, I remember sitting in my study, glued to the television set, watching the election. I think y'all know exactly what I'm talking about here, being super excited and everything. And as those election results came in, I was thrilled. The next morning I woke up, went for a walk, came across this black man, black man who was a little bit older than me, living back down south at the time in Texas. Been watching the news lately? Yeah, we'll not be moving back there anytime soon. Um, as I was walking through, walking through that space, this brother walked past me and we looked at each other and I asked him the question. I said, how are you doing this morning? He looked at me in my eyes and said, it's a fine day. And he repeated that three times. And we just looked at each other and kept walking because that's all we needed to say. And we understood what was taking place. The smile and the smile back. You see, electing a black man to the White House, it didn't even touch the tip of the iceberg, folks. Not even close. We hadn't reached the promised land. We thought we did. But we haven't, henceforth, one of the reasons we're here today. We're here to talk about the challenges we've got to continue to address, the challenges that even William Lloyd Garrison was wrestling with, and that brother would be disappointed in some ways. All that work, all that effort, and here we are still seeing the elements and vestiges of white supremacy in place. Oh, the issues that we face, the ubiquitous matter of race in the United States. You see, almost two centuries ago, that prophetic agitator named William Lloyd Garrison professed that God would transform the United States in such a way that we would see Christian love. Brother Martin would call it radical love, something that I talk about quite a bit. A love that usurps hate, bigotry, bigotry, oppression in all types of forms and fashions. Garrison's prophetic lens went so far as to proclaim that a black president, check this out, a black president would one day rule these United States. Garrison said that in the 19th century. Yeah, no wonder they thought he was a fanatic. I'm surprised they didn't lock him up at that point and throw away the key. <laughs> Folks, I have a lot to say. But what I like to do is I want to focus on, on three things tonight as we move through this, is this celebration. But the celebration is about having a nice little conversation about the realities of hard stuff. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about Garrison's faith and how his faith transformed him into being a radical abolitionist and a crusader in a way to drive anti-racism. The second thing we're going to talk about is that brother's semblance of being a romantic and a part of the romantic period in the United States and how his rational mind struggled with the ambiguity of the Enlightenment and the politics of that time, particularly how that was constructed under the Constitution. And then lastly, we're going to talk about that brother's relevancy, his impact, his legacy today. So let's, let's delve into his faith a little bit. 
and how his faith transformed him. You know, Garrison was akin to Apostle Paul, who encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul went from persecuting Christians to being one of the greatest evangelistic efforts in convincing people to follow Jesus as the Messiah. The promise, brother, is what he said. Garrison ignited a revolution to the likes of, um, of, of Martin Luther, to the likes of Apostle Paul. But unlike those folks, in a conversation I was having before we got up here tonight, lots of books, a lot of stuff has been written. And we're here tonight because in many ways, Garrison's become somewhat of a, a false memory to folks. They had to pull out their phones and look up who William Lloyd Garrison is. Don't know how radical that brother is or was. More than anything, folks have assigned him to a mere paragraph in history textbooks taught in classrooms, and folks don't understand that he is exemplifying the message that white folks need to follow. This is how you become an anti-racist. As I delve a little bit more into the gospel according to William Lloyd Garrison here on his birthday. I want us to think about his prophetic voice of God and how that voice was really designed to eradicate the evils of slavery. But I also think about Garrison in ways where I sit there and I think about my relationship with people. See, people, I'm going to tell you right now, I will always show up for justice. And folks who know me know that my favorite quote is, justice is what love looks like in public. You want to love somebody radically? Then you are going to show up for them. Folks are being oppressed, living on the margins, like that brother Garrison did. I'm going to show up. I'm not going to be in that third or excuse me, in that first bucket of folks who just don't care. I'm not going to be a part of the bucket that most people fall into. And this is what we have to think about Garrison and check ourselves a little bit. That bucket where people say, well, Brother Carson, I will show up for you. If you're in trouble, I will be there for you. You can depend on me. I'm a radical white anti-racist, and I want to be there for the plight of black people when they're struggling. I will show up for you. I will show up for queer folks, for Muslims, for Jewish folks, women, people who are being oppressed. I will be there. And people will say that, and guess what will happen? You give them a call, and they don't answer that phone call. I like to tell folks. <laughs> I was telling some students this once. Remember now, these students are like, I don't know, probably 16, 17 year old. And my, my, my example is, if I have one quarter left, I'm going to put it in a pay phone to call that person. Then I have to stop and say, well, first, do y'all know what a pay phone looks like? What a pay phone is? But you know what I'm talking about. I have that one quarter left. And I have to call someone to show up because I'm in trouble. And I want to know who loves me so much that they're so radical that they will show up and defeat oppression at the doorsteps in any kind of way. And then I think about that list, folks. And it's small. It's a small list of folks who I think will show up. I do believe that Brother Garrison would have showed up. Why? Because in eradicating slavery, he believed in immediate abolition. And he had to get there. He had to get there. He practices elements of gradualism at times too, but he had to get there. But yet, immediate abolition was his gospel message. Think about that for a second. Brother living through his faith and through the message that he had. It arrived by way of his faith as a leader of the abolitionist movement that drove his sense of being an evangelical Christian to the ways in which he looked at sin, not as a personal individual element, but something that was so grand and ubiquitous throughout society that it had to be cured. And the only way to cure such a disease was for him to be radical. Every single day, the brother had to be radical, showing up, not hiding out, not pretending, not thinking that this element doesn't exist. 
In effect, 19th century evangelicalism supported this reformist disposition. He valued personal freedom and personal liberty. He would greatly disagree in many ways with America's 20th, 21st century obsession with building grand statues of men of the Enlightenment, or I should say people of the Enlightenment, for whom we worship. I think back to that element when my wife and I went to D.C. And while they're visiting the Holocaust Museum, raise your hand if you've been there before in D.C. Powerful, isn't it, people? Walking through that space in D.C. and getting to the end. You remember the end? With the shoes. Both of us just bawling our eyes out, crying. Thinking about the pain and the suffering, and, and, and I'm thinking about that, that radical brother, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, and wondering, where will the folks who are going to show up for injustice, show people what love looked like at a particular time, doing some of the things that people looked at that white brother Garrison and said, Garrison, brother, you're white. And when you're white, you don't have to do anything. You can be comfortable. You can sit back and sip on a little wine or bourbon or, oh, guess what? He was also part of the temperance movement, too. So <laughs> we would have to have that conversation a little bit later. So he wouldn't be doing that. But, you know, he, just why do that? You're set. Why even worry about it? And yet, my wife Jeanette and I, you know, we cried. We were like, where were people? Where were people thinking about the souls of other folks here, folks? I sat there. I thought about when we were in my hometown of Montgomery, Alabama. And you go to the lynching memorial. And in the lynching memorial, as you go into the space, they have these, like, tombs. And as you go closer, they elevate. And what it feels like are Bodies being lynched above you. Then you start reading the stories, the stories that are similar to that of Emmett Till, 14-year-old boy from South Chicago down in Mississippi, and you're asking, why did they have to shoot the brother, drag him, and dump him into a river? Because he whistled at a white woman? Are you kidding me? Or lynching someone just because they crossed the street? Or they got water out of the fountain that didn't say colored only? And then... We wept and we were sad. We looked around spaces and we thought about things like, where were folks at? Where were my white co-conspirators, the white allies? Where were the people like Garrison when all of this was happening? Our, through tears as we both cried through that, thinking about it, that anger kind of setting in once we thought about it. And we just wondered. We found ourselves worshiping people who we're not social justice, radical, loving folks. Before we left D.C., we went to visit Jefferson's memorial, and we told him that he is no god. D.C. is nothing but another Athenian city full of temples worshiping false prophets. Worshiping... <laughs> but you know... We're not here, though, to worship Garrison. We're here to celebrate his ideals for being a white brother who's going to show up and who did the world justice, did my black soul justice, did all folks justice in so many ways. We want to thank him for being a white co-conspirator and really thinking about the realities of humanity. He reflected that humanity of our spirit and the notions of truth towards each other as we think about the differences. We think about how Garrison influenced and rallied uh, in his gospel of faith for this immediate end for slavery in two ways. One, his gospel, what did it do? It mobilized people to become a part of the abolitionist movement, which we know, right? People were like, hey, let's jump on board. We're going to do that. We're going to use our evangelical Christian faith as a part of this Protestant activism that's going to take place. So that's one of the elements. But the second thing that's going to happen here is he's going to use that radical message in his faith as an evangelical Christian to really make a storming cry for the immediate end of slavery. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Not all converts to evangelical religion became radical abolitionists. Many remained socially conservative. Focusing on personal and individual sin and not the things they need to focus on. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Not all converts did that. Many remain in that pattern. For them and a the majority of evangelical Christians, such as Charles Finney and Lyman Beecher, evangelical revivalism was the primary reform. They weren't worried about the plight of women in their struggles, nor were they worried about the problem and the sins and the challenges of slavery in which you can take a human being by which God created and said you are defined as property and you're inferior and I can treat you like I treat anything else that's not of value or worth to me. They viewed sin from the lens of individual behavior and preached only about matters of the soul. There were no cries about social and political evils. In their eyes, slavery was not about the soul, people. It was not a personal sin. And thus, abolition was secondary to the moral and spiritual reformation that needed to happen. There was no integrity there whatsoever. And that has been a conflict among black and white evangelicals for a long period of time. And that's even true today. Whites spend their time discussing the soul and not addressing social justice matters as Garrison once did. Now, I don't know about folks' faith background or anything like that, and, and I'm making that grand statement, but I, I think about some radical white folks who are evangelicals, and they're still trying to raise that message. Jim Wallace, being one of those folks. Rachel Evans, that dear sister who passed away not too long ago, who was talking about the challenges and the problems within the white evangelical community in the absence of white people standing up for justice the way they need it to. Using the Gospels of Christ as a symbol of anti-racism, Garrison moved folks to follow his radical message of, of emancipation from then to the issues today. And the way we do it today is how we think about the conversations that need to happen. Often we hear folks saying things like, well, come on, Brother Carson, you know, be patient. All this shouting and getting people worked up and trying to move folks. People need their time and their space. Meet them where they are. I want you to think about that. Think about meeting white folks and particularly some Southern folks in the 19th century where they are. What, under a tree, looking up? Is that, mean, is that what it is? I mean, it's not sugar-coated because we're talking about the elements of death to find truth here. And that's how we have to think about this. We have to think about this whole element of Let's just love each other in a way in which we don't cause trouble or, or think about turmoil. That's cheap talk, folks. We don't have time for any of that stuff. You know, I want to tell you about this brother in terms of being one of the disciples of, of that radical, fanatic brother named Garrison by the name of Samuel May. And Samuel May saw Garrison as a prophet. He sat there and watched him speak, watch him put his white body into spaces that endangered him and quickly became one of his 12 disciples, particularly after witnessing his talk of his own incarceration down in Baltimore. And how after Garrison was incarcerated, he went through this moment in which he felt the soul that Apostle Paul probably felt when he was in prison in Rome and he wrote his prison epistles where he came out saying, I want to be a more radical brother for the souls of black folks. I've got to do this because I believe in my faith. I believe in radical love in such a way. And those are the things that are going to happen. But Garrison professed in many ways to his own co-conspirators. And I like co-conspirators here, folks. I quote, Justice has been denied to me in a single instance. How ought it to a flame for two million as valuable and immortal souls who are crushed beneath the iron car of despotism? Oh, that my countrymen might feel as keenly for black skin as much as they love their white skin. Can they move beyond that? Can they see my love without just dismissing me because of the color of my skin?
I continue to be fascinated by how he took biblical injunctions seriously enough to incur the wrath of clergymen. And he pressed the claims of the American Revolutionary Creed with an insistence that put him at odds with so many folks. We're not here to be popular folks. Because if being popular means turning a blind eye, turning your back to the problems of injustice, then you have sold your soul to the ultimate sin that dominates society, which, that, which is that of complacency, selfishness, loneliness, isolation. His belief in the power of the word and his faith in moral regeneration became the touchstone of his politics and the themes of suffering and love. This white brother knew what Martin Luther King knew, which is this, and I want you to think about this, that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that's why we're here to celebrate, but we're also here to think about justice. Armed with the gospels, both Martin and Garrison understood themselves as radicals as they used their integrity and their element of spiritual vision as forces for change. Like the abolitionists, Brother King would rescue Jesus and the cross from the same folks who used Jesus and the cross to lynch Negroes. The cross lit, hanging them up in the name of their faith and in their belief. And Brother King's going to come back and he's going to do what Garrison did. I'm going to take that from you. And I'm going to tell you why there's nothing but injustice that's taking place here, too. Both men epitomize the courage needed to expose the injustices perpetrated by the forces of white supremacy. They were saddened by folks of faith who wore the cloth. Many churchmen were opposed to Garrison's use of faith as a directive from God in enacting the emancipation of slaves. And not only a man, not only a eliminating the emancipation of slavery. But that brother walked around and he said radical stuff that made folks think he was just a fanatic. I want my black brothers and sisters and non-binary folks and all those folks over there to congregate, to sit down and eat bread with me. Because we're all part of the same faith, this faith that brings us together. And that faith is that of humanity. Garrison and Brother King responded to the complacency of white society, but particularly Christian folk in firmness. None of that soft talk. Garrison used the liberator to condemn the clergyman the same way Brother King used his letter from a Birmingham jail to condemn northern white liberals and clergymen who believe that that's just a southern problem why they sat back and did nothing. That became the reality that was there. And that's what needed to be addressed. In his 20th century essay, The Church in the Color Line, civil rights activist, scholar, for the folks who know me, I have an intimate relationship with this brother too by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois, another son of Massachusetts, concluded that white evangelical Christians in the white Churches are incapable of mending the color line. That is not possible because we've seen that, that mending. That conclusion about the church was clear as black theologian and intellectual James Cone, who's also the father of black liberation theology. He noted in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, that there were Symbols of terror, instruments of torture and execution reserved primarily for slaves, criminals, and insurrectionists, and the lowest of the low. That Jewish brother named Jesus and blacks were publicly humiliated, subjected to the utmost indignity and cruelty, according to him. Cone went on to say that 5,000 African-American men, women, and children would be essentially eliminated from the years, 1880, beyond the Civil War, to 1940 in what was known as the 60-year Black Holocaust. And during that time period, Garrison, not Garrison, excuse me, um, Cohn is going to state through his research 
No one in white churches, no preachers, no family folks, no evangelists, no one was preaching, writing, and publishing about the injustices that were happening to black folks. I sit there and I think about, well, what do folks do the next day after George Floyd's murdered? How do they cry out to Mir Rice, Michael, Michael, Michael Brown? Do they pause and they hesitate? Do they feel sorry, then move on? Haven't we observed that quite a bit? That radical reaction from society. White folks organizing in a way and saying that, oh my goodness, did you see that tape of George Floyd? And I'm sitting there saying, have you seen the five, six, seven other tapes of other folks in terms of what's happening? Why are we now outraged? And then, five, six months later, those same folks who are outraged are talking about, well, we shouldn't talk about critical race theory and systemic racism. Those things make my white kid feel guilty about being white, and that's not their fault. We need to move on and not talk about this stuff at all. Amnesia. How we forget overnight about the problems of sin and injustice. County Cullen's poem, The South is Crucifying Christ Again, written during the Harlem Renaissance time, commissioned by W.E.B. Du Bois, takes Christ and put Christ in a black body. Christ's awful wrong is that he is dark of hue, the sin for which no blamelessness atones. But at least the sameness of the cross should tire. They kill him now with famished tongues of fire. And while he burns, good men and women too, shout battling of his black and brittle black bones. The death of the black Christ. Because we can't allow someone to come here and profess the love and define justice with black people. Blacks, according to Cone, were stripped in order to be deprived of, dig of their dignity, then paraded, mocked and whipped, pierced and spat upon, tortured for hours in the presence of jeering crowds. Popular entertainment. For you folks, you've seen this picture. Oftentimes, I would invite students into my class, and I would tell them that you're just going to come in, and you're going to look, and you're going to listen. I always gave them a little trigger warning because it's going to be emotionally overwhelming. I'm going to put up on the screen an image of black bodies hanging from that popular tree. Strange fruit, as we know in terms of what was happening. Billie Holiday kind of mastered it in a sense that my students sat there and they listened to Strange Fruit and looked at that image. And I wanted them to sit with that for a second and think about the suffering and the pain that existed in so many ways. The purpose was to strike terror in our community, but it was also to let people know that the same thing would happen to them if they started problems. You see, Garrison's radical transformation was clearly defined by this tone that black folks are feeling in which they are constantly under siege during slavery, Jim Crow, and the new Jim Crow, which is today. Systemic racism, health inequities, the issues of which Black people were struggling to even navigate through white spaces. I look at these beautiful, amazing faces here. Then I ask myself, where are the black and brown faces at? Do they not congregate this space in Newburyport? Are folks radical enough to find a way to make sure that we can diversify this community to look and exist in a way that Garrison would want? That's your challenge right there. If you're gonna be radical, you're gonna sit there and you're gonna say Newburyport is just, wow, it's just really white. <laughs> and I know it is because, look, when I go for a walk down here, people like fall all over themselves looking at me, coming up and asking me questions. I'm not kidding. We get to this point where 
we think about the struggles and how it must exist in the age of Black Lives Matter. But yet this community, in many ways, is like the church on Sunday. Martin Luther King said, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday. As an evangelical Christian, Garrison attacked white Christian nationalism. On Sundays at 11 o'clock, white society used misinterpreted biblical scripture to justify black inferiority. As the Civil War approached by 1861, folks spoke of the sin of the war being driven by abolitionists. We get to that war, and the next thing we know, that 600 and, I don't know, 20,000 people are dead. I think that calculates to roughly around 6 million people today. Can you imagine a war today in which 6 million people died? We would be outraged overnight. And all of that's happening because we can't figure out a way to mend the color line. As we think about this sister named Kristen Dumez's book, Jesus and John Wayne, she explores white evangelicals not only being corrupted by faith, but during the 21st century, they were divided in a way that's driving people of different races in different directions. And that's the thing that we have to address. This element of white evangelical Protestants, that transformation today that looks greatly different from that transformation that Garrison dropped or thought about too. So how do we think about sin? Garrison believed that slavery was a national sin in which Northern and Southerners were complicit. But that, that sin really came over into the political discourse. And that political discourse really brings us to him being this, this romantic in how he thought about society. Folks too often talk about civility, politeness. Not challenging the status quo and keeping silent because that is what genteel folks do. But society needs disruptors. Society, society needs agitators. Society needs more folks like Garrison. Society needs more white people like Garrison. More white people like Garrison who are willing to put aside and surrender their comforts and normality of whiteness in a way that exposes the grand wrongs and evils and injustices that exist within society. I'm not just talking about Montgomery, Alabama either. <laughs> Let's bring it right here in home in many ways too. You know, that brother started being an agitator on July 4th, 1829. Right even before he went to this moment where he transformed himself in a way in which Apostle Paul did. When he stated at, while preaching at the Park Street Church that the American Colonization Society is committing acts of sins and injustice. And the thing that's really driving that sin and that injustice was the Constitution of the United States. People get upset. Oh, my goodness. He would really speak so evil of such sacred documents. Garrison told a room, and I quote, if we are always to remain shackled by unjust constitutional provisions, then disunion is not our fault. Garrison advocating that the North secede from the South. But yet the problem with that is the problem of racial capitalism and the way capitalism existed in that time. Because we all know that Newburyport was a problem of slavery. We can point fingers deep down south and everything, everything, but this community was constructed on the back and on the labor of black slavery. That's another conversation we need to have, and we'll get to that conversation as we think about how that brother disavowed his racist, white supremacist proclivities in order to become an anti-racist within society. You know, he repudiated his past behaviors and sins, and he noted, I quote, I seized this opportunity to make a full and unequivocal recantation and thus publicly ask God, society, and my country to pardon my wrongdoing. I can't believe there was a time in life in which I thought sending black people back to Africa was the best thing to do. Passing myself as a, a pretender. Passing myself as someone who likes black people, who cares about society and the country, but yet manifesting white supremacy actions. And yet his transformation allowed that to change in so many ways. But yet, while he had some admirations for the Declaration of Independence, he struggled with the Constitution. He struggled with it because he saw it as a compact, dripping, 
with blood. The United, the United States Constitution was nothing but a blood bath document filled with blood that soaked it so much, and that blood was the blood of Negroes who were engulfed in the sins of this country. He demanded disunion. But in driving at disunion, oftentimes I think about the challenge is when we think about race and garrison in a constitution. The fact that Richard Hofstetter is a historian. Um, I'm a huge fan. I'm a particularly big fan of his book, uh, The American Political Tradition. And in there, he has an opening chapter titled Founding Fathers. It's a chapter that I used to encourage my students to read. Well, okay, that's a lie. I made them read it. <laughs> and. And in there, Richard Hofstetter talked about the founding fathers in ways that was so prophetic and so true, the fact that they were instruments who created a document of elitism. They feared democratic ideas because they feared that if democracy actually took root among the discontent and oppressed people, their wealth and their property would be under attack and in a lot of trouble, keeping poor white folks who didn't have property from voting keeping blacks, keeping women, all of those things happening. Folks often forget that the American Revolutionary War was driven by a desire to disrupt an imperial system known as mercantilism only to manifest notions of racial capitalism in order to protect the wealth and integrity of slave owners in this country. But let's just keep celebrating them in the ways that we do. Why don't we have an honest conversation? Well, because, you know, that's just that's George Washington. You know, we can't have that truth. He's the founder. We love him. He's perfect. He chopped down a, I'm going to have fun here, a peach tree or something like that. <laughs> Garrison understood the manifestation of racial capitalism because he understood that this is a document that was designed to prevent mobocracy. And to prevent mobocracy is to keep the marginalized folks silent. You know, the worst thing that can happen in a racist white supremacy society is when you bring a bunch of folks from different races together and they become aware of their own humanity. And then they start to organize because they understand what radical love looks like. And yet that becomes a threat to the ruling class in so many ways that that cannot happen. And we saw that often take place during Jim Crow age. And I would argue some of that is an element true to, to today. You know, we think about, you know, people going after Garrison. Nat Turner, they blame that on Garrison. Went through Virginia killing, you know, tons, hundreds of white folks. Garrison would keep silent in a way to not upset and anger nor justify violence. But yet one of the things that Nat Turner would do is he would do it he did it in a way that Garrison said, this is what happens, we don't solve the problem of race and slavery. He would disagree with that quite a bit too. But that would lead to the revolution of 65 and the challenges of that revolution. It would really bring us to the point where Douglas and Garrison are gonna be in contention over the document, over the Constitution, as Douglas is going to move himself to saying that the Constitution is not a document for slavery. The two brothers would disagree, but they would find a way to come back together and find some semblance of truth as they look to find ways to drive change that needed to happen. You know, this brings me to my last, my third and my final point here, folks, and that is Garrison's legacy and impact today. Garrison's agitation against the Constitution recalled the Protestant reformers and the politics of the Hebrew prophets. He anticipated in many ways and inspired great revolutionary folks of the 20th century. I'm talking about he understood notions before those notions came to fruition through radical love in which he influenced folks like Thoreau in his civil disobedience. We know that Thoreau is going to have a huge influence on Mahatma Gandhi. We know Gandhi's going to influence this radical black gay brother by the name of Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin is going to inspire another radical black brother by the name of Martin Luther King to profess nonviolence. You see, 
that intimate night when, when Bayard showed up at, at Brother King's Atlanta home. He couldn't even get inside his house because King had, he had guards out there armed to protect him. Byard said, you can't make a movement happen if you got folks out there with guns. We need peaceful non-violence to show the kind of radical love that's needed. And we know that Brother Garrison really sought that out in so many ways. Brother Martin, peaceful non-violence, would go on to say, it is as much a moral obligation to cooperate with evil as it is to cooperate with good. Such a powerful language. Most Americans today think the Constitution as, a embodying, as embodying a radical dream of racial equality, which evil is so deeply entrenched. In reality, even if we think about those who interpret that document, it feels like a pipe dream. Not even a reality, nor is it close. Many see it as embracing radical equality in a ways in which we watch Martin's dream fade to the abyss. And Garrison would agree. Think about it. In order for people of color, queer folk and women to have a legitimate voice in this country, black folks, brown folks, immigrants, queer folks to have a legitimate voice in this country, we've had to depend on legislation or the courts to say that you're invited and all other folks were already in as they wrestled with that. When we point this out, we're accused of identity politics or being radical. And if you're garrison, being a radical and a fanatic. The United States was constructed on the notion that all people were created equal, but we know that to be somewhat of a falsity. Why? Women were denied the right to vote. And after obtaining a franchise, black women would still need 45 more years before they could vote. Same-sex couples would need another 50 years before they had justice in this country. Garrison exemplified rare positions that many white men avoid, which is putting their identity on the front lines of battle in order to bring about changes that's there. You know, I want to embarrass my... my Brilliant and awesome colleague who's here tonight, excellent historian and history teacher, Bill Quigley. And one of the things that we talk about is that how do we fully delve into conversations of thinking about differences in a way in which we can embrace the interpretation of the narrative by which other people come to the table. And that's the hard thing. And we've had that conversation on, 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 on a number of, of, of occasions. I've come to wholly believe that here in the 21st century, we would be outraged by the injustices of a government that does not want to see us manifest that love. Oh, I can see Garrison rolling in his grave over the idea that a country like this would deny Muslims entry into a country just because of their faith and their national origin. Folks, we have a lot of work to do here. And as we do that work, and as we think about the realities that need to be transformed, we need to think about where we sit and where do you stand in this battle. Hello, Jim Crow. Welcome to the 21st century. Because it is a reality that exists. As I come to a conclusion here, We think about how Garrison's faith made him radical, how his ambition and drive to welcome all folks into the spaces that exist. I'm talking to primarily white folks here. And I have a message for white folks. White racism in white institutions and communities must be eradicated by you. What do you want me to do, folks? What do you want me to do? I can't do anything. I need you to stand up. I need you to march out of here. I need you to destroy, to destroy those vestiges that Garrison worked so hard to destroy. 
I can't do that as an oppressed, marginalized person within a racist, white supremacist land. Your whiteness, your privilege allows those things to happen. In fact, white racism is the primary responsibility of white people. It's the primary responsibility of Garrison, not Brother King, not Malcolm, not Marcus Garvey, not W.E.B. Du Bois, not Harriet Tubman. White supremacy today has convinced white people, good white liberals, white people with their Black Lives Matter signs outside, that the reality of systemic and structural racism in this country is not as bad as it seems. A fact that policing, health inequities, wealth disparities do exist. I think back to the Boston Spotlight series. Average white household wealth and income in Boston is $250,000 a year for a white family. For a black family, $8. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The total wealth income in the Boston area is $250,000. And for black folks, when we think about wealth, home ownership, all of those things, debt, all of the problems with credit lending and all of those things that have happened to black folks, it is $8. And until white people start taking a look at those injustices that have manifested Jim Crow in different ways, then the legacy of Garrison is lost. We can't get caught up in talking about things like the problem of critical race theory and how it makes me feel bad when it's just talking about the statistical realities of truth in which I just presented to you. I don't need white folks to feel guilty about being white. No one should feel guilty. I need white folks to be radical. I need white folks to love me so much and love the souls of black folks that they see injustices across this country that people think we've seen the reincarnation of Brother Garrison again. That's what I need from white folks. That is what I need from you who are sitting in this space. As we think about states that are moving to dismiss conversations, saying that you can't call the KKK a terrorist group, you can't teach certain documents by Brother King because we're here to protect the integrity of whiteness, I need white folks to raise their eyebrows and say, we have a problem, and I will not tolerate that problem. Part of the legacy, folks, of Garrison is us talking about white fears. Those fears have not subsided here in the 21st century. Some folks believe that now is one of the worst times to engage in conversations about race. Too political. We're too divided. I disagree. We need to talk about it even more. White allies have and can continue to play a significant role. In a struggle against white racism and the vestiges of white supremacy. Black autonomy and leadership, while there, may not be sufficient. And you need to be a partner in that journey in bringing this change. But an even more important task for white America is to examine yourself, examine your relationships, examine your institutions, examine your communities, examine your society, and ask yourself, am I just mailing it in? Am I just comfortable? Am I just okay with the status quo in terms of things that are happening? I don't see people that look like Eddie around here. That's not my problem. Oh, it's just fun to talk about those problems and live into the grand realities of a textbook. Or are you going to raise up and be radical activists? See. I have this amazing advisory group right here. I'm gonna embarrass them and ask you to stand up for me real quick, folks. Go ahead and stand up. Come on, come on, stand up. Stand up. I want you to turn around, look at the face. Take a look at them, folks. Thank you. My advisory group is probably the most diverse advisory group on the campus at the Governor Academies. I have 
Christians and heathens like me and Muslims have black folks from who are Dominican, from Latin America or Central America, have folks who are or one of my soul sisters who's not here because she had a game tonight, um, another white sister. And I look at them and I sit there and I say, that is what I want right here. I need your help. They need your help. What are you gonna do? I want you to walk out of here tonight feeling radical. I want people to call you a radical because you love so much that is unbelievable. I want folks to accuse you of being a fanatic like they did Garrison because you are going to be in that third bucket. When we put that quarter into that payphone booth, your phone is going to ring and you're going to show up and you're going to defeat injustices. That is the legacy of William Lloyd Garrison. Folks, I appreciate your time tonight. I appreciate the space. I hope I said something that may have touched your soul, made you ponder, contemplate, and think about the realities of being radical, being like that brother Garrison, using your white privilege to challenge the elements that bring ill to society. I hope, to, I hope you reach out to me. I hope you reach out to me and say, Brother Carson, I do love you. I, oh, I love you so much that I am there and I'm telling you I'm reaching out to you because you can call me anytime because I'm going to fix Newburyport. I'm not worried about Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I love you folks because radical love is us finding a way to come together as all kind of folks. Black, brown, white, Asian, straight, queer folk, all kind of folks in trying to solve these problems that capitalism has kind of tricked us into believing that they don't exist. Can I get an amen? amen. my friend and soul sister Deborah Owen to come up and we're going to embrace an element of radical love before we go to a Q&A and we're going to hear this amazing sister sing what I believe is one of the most beautiful Christian songs by Wilberforce who talked about his sins and how Wilberforce, William Wilberforce moved away from the sins and asked God for forgiveness and an apology to do that. for this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was blind but now I see through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis grace that brought me
thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Eddie, will you take a few questions? I promise not to be as long with you this time. <laughs> well, let's see if anyone has questions. Anyone? Great. Thank you. Ed, thank you very much for tonight. It's very humbling. Very humbling tonight. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, to hear the story. I have a question about moral courage. Yes. It seems like we're called upon tonight by you to exert our own personal moral courage in light of what you just hope we share as we go forward. When free and fair elections are being challenged by political um, scenes, and especially in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Where is the moral court today, and how can we feel better about living in society where we just really question, is moral courage even possible anymore in the light of the situation? So That's please address great, that. Yeah, I appreciate that question. That's a wonderful question. When we talk about moral, moral, moral courage, we have to start with outrage. And you know, oftentimes we sit there and we say, that's happening in that state, that's happening over there. We're in Massachusetts and those things are not exactly happening here, but yet our voices have to be used and we need people to hear us as someone such as yourself pointing to the fact that there were people, I had my mother, let me pause, I had my mother on my podcast recently race matters. And she was there talking about her time growing up in the deep south, the Jim Crow south. And we talked about all the sacrifices and the struggles people made in order to be able to cast the vote to do that. And as we had that conversation, I, I wrestled with the fact that folks want to dismiss Black, brown, white, all kind of folks of different races who died and who sacrifices so that black souls and bodies could have the right to vote, to participate in a participatory democracy. And in order that, for that to happen, people have to be loud in, 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 in a sense of outrage. The fact that what's going on now reminds me of what I said earlier, and that is that I'm a second-class citizen in a country I don't belong to. My silence and not having the right to vote and, and, and share my thoughts and my concerns is being politicized in a way to advantage one group over another. We gotta talk about it, you know? I mean, Massachusetts is not perfect, folks. We have to figure out what are the things we need to wrestle with here. It's not Georgia. It's not some of the things that's going on there. But, I mean, have you seen what's going on in New Hampshire lately? Right across the border. Good. Anyone else? Questions? Yeah. Here you go. 
thank you for being here, first of all. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question on assimilation. How should our country, or for that matter, our workplace, our churches, our communities, uh, balance assimilation and cultural pride? Um, how do we prevent losing valuable differences between people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't believe in assimilation, first of all. <laughs> I, I, I want to go ahead and say that. Thank you. I don't, I, I don't believe in assimilation. I believe that what makes the United, so, the United States so great is the fact that so many people from so many different backgrounds and cultural identities and elements come together and they form what we call the United States. The United States doesn't look like something where we have this ideal setting of what Americans should look like, what should, they should sound like, how they should talk, their language, their culture. Who is it to decide how someone celebrates the 4th of July, if they celebrate the 4th of July? Who is it to decide? People within society should um, engage in thought-provoking conversations around food. I mean, that's the best way you know, folks. I, I'm a soul brother from the South. That means I like to break bread. And breaking bread means um, food and wine and having a good time. But I do it on my own terms, and I invite folks to the space and to the table who look different from me, knowing that they're going to see that I'm a black man in this country, and I bring something there. That's true for folks who are Muslim. That's true for folks who may be Hindu or for, who may be Jewish. That is, I think that is what's great about this country, the idea that there is no need to assimilate. It's for us to be who we are and bring our gifts and our background and our heritages to one that creates this element. There, there's a concern that's happening where folks are worried that some of the pushback we're, that we're seeing in society, going back to your question over the political tension, is the fact that, and I, I'm gonna get the date wrong, so uh, I'll do my best, but I wanna say around 2040, 2050, White Americans, for the first time, will be in a minority in this country's history, and that is scaring folks. I remember hearing John King, a Republican congressman out of Iowa, say that people of color, black people, did nothing, nor did they create anything great in society. That's why this country is white, and we need to continue to manifest whiteness that's here. He said this in public, <laughs> of all things, in terms of what's going on. But it's just it's our gifts. I tell folks one of my most ideal times is when I can sit at a table, I can break bread with folks, and they can bring their whole and true selves to the table where we're going to break bread and have wine. White folks, brown folks, queer folks, Muslim, Jews. Thank you. OK, Anyone and else? even Republicans, too, I guess. Anyone else? <laughs> Uh, Kim. I had to think about that one a little bit. Pass it. Sorry. There you go. Thank Sorry you. Hello. Okay. A question about um, reparations. Yep. Would you consider reparations something that the society could embrace for African American descendants of slaves or indigenous people as something we could use to move forward? So the first thing that's got to happen in order for um, for us to even start the conversation about reparations is that the United States of, of, of America has to step up and apologize for what yeah. it did to indigenous people and what it did for the enslavement of black folks. <laughs> this government has never apologized to black folks nor indigenous folks for what it has done to us. It has never. So that's the first thing that's got to happen. I want an apology. Then the second thing that we have to do, and, and, and people have the wrong idea of reparations in, in writing a check and mailing it to folks. Why don't we start in the community of Newburyport where we're thinking about a center for the study of African slaves and indigenous folks as a form of reparation. We're educating people to understand our past sins. That's the kind of reparations we need to have right there. I want to champion education and knowledge, not this idea that we're mailing paychecks. See, people have become convinced and they've hoodwinked this idea 
in order to create racial and ideological division between folks that we're going to take money out of your paycheck to pay for something that you had nothing to do. That's not what reparations is about. I'd love to see something happen here in Newburyport. I'm just saying, just going to throw that out at you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to, will you hand it? Thank you. Sure. Do I have to turn it on? No, there we go. Hi. Uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, visit Selma not once but twice. And um, one thing I would want to say to everyone is that Selma is much more than the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So that obviously what, you know, I think that, like, it is a beautiful city, but it's economically blighted. And I was sort of wondering, I wanted to ask you, what can, like, we in Newburyport do for a community like Selma and other similar communities? Ooh, that's, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, honestly, brother, I don't know if I can give you an answer. I'll give an aspirational um, answer. So my mother grew up in Selma. Born in Linden, spent a lot of time in, in Linden. I have family in Selma. My wife and I, we have gone, we've driven over to Edmund Pettus Bridge a number of times, and we won't get into that brother's problems and, and elements too, uh, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And, 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 and Selma, Selma's an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy that's there. I told my mama when she was here in town with my wife and I for a couple weeks that I was probably in high school before I realized that white people lived in Selma. Because I didn't even know white people lived in Selma. That's how segregated Selma was and still is today. And so to answer your question, you know, I, I don't know. Wouldn't it, be, I, I, wouldn't it be awesome to just have the mayor of Newburyport just pick up the phone and call the mayor of Selma and say, brother, we're a white community and you're a predominantly black community. How do we form a relationship that may bring about any economic um, advantages for both of us in which we can connect our communities in different ways? That would be the first start. Wow. We have time for one more question. Anyone else? Oh, we got one right here. I can hear you far away. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, the one thing I'll say is I'm, I'm blessed and I'm fortunate because um, I, I gave a lecture, um, I think it was 2008, 2009, at a, at a conference Howard Zinn was speaking at. And much like my students being here today, my wife uh, and, and, and about, I don't know, probably eight or nine of my students went to, to hear my talk. And the idea of hearing Zen was just, it was just unbelievable. I, I think, to your point, I, I, I want to think about it like a photograph. And if I were to, if we were all to stand here and take a big picture of ourselves, the first thing we're going to do when we look at that photograph is we're going to go look for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, that's what we're going to do. And as we look for ourselves, we need to also ask ourselves about the issue of omission in terms of who is not present in this space in that photograph. And we can't just look at ourselves, but we got to look at the obvious stuff about there's something wrong with this picture. And I think that is what needs to happen. And I know there's one question back there. Can I take that one yes, question? Yes, absolutely. Done? Okay. Last question. Thank you. Um, I'm a former history teacher. I didn't teach very long, but going way back into the uh, 70s. And with this pandemic, I spent some of my time reading a book called Cast. Isabel Wilkerson. Yeah. Excellent, yes. excellent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the other book that I just finished reading is This Land is Their Land. Yes. Uh, and um, the Unitarian Church, which I'm a member of, is going to have a 
program discussing um, the this land is your land. I can tell you what I didn't know in the 70s makes me so sad. And this critical race theory that's starting to come out, and now some people are objecting to it, I just hope that that people read like, like you're suggesting and get involved and find out what really happened here when the colonists came over and continued <laughs> all the way through till now. My friend, thank you for that comment. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. So, Eddie, before we close tonight, if it would be okay, I would like to ask um, the family members, the um, historical family members from William Lloyd Garrison, if you would stand so that we could honor you on his birthday. Yes. I'm sure there's some here. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to ask... We'd also like to ask the family members if you would join us for a few moments at the, in the reception hall afterwards as well. Thank you much. Eddie, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here this evening. Uh, folks, I really appreciate your time. I love you a lot. I'm hard on white folks. It's okay. I'm sorry, by the way. No, 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 but I appreciate it. No, but listen to me. No, but here's what I want. I, I want you to think about what I said. I mean, I, I want you to walk out here, fire it up, and I want you to think about what I said and think about how we can do this together, all of us. I hope to hear from y'all sometime. Take care. I enjoy it. Thank you, my friend.